Hi, good afternoon and welcome. We are here in studio talking sports with Val and we're, we're actually going to be uh, filming here on Thursday because Val, you'll be down at Evansville for the state wrestling meet uh, Friday and uh, hopefully Saturday as well. So we're going to film it a day early here and Apologize, we didn't get the uh, opportunity to do the show last week, so we're going to talk a little bit uh, about some things from last week as well. So uh, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. First off, though, how are you, Val? Yeah, doing well, Steve. Uh, something interesting happened in the state of Illinois yesterday. They approved girls' flag football as a sport. Really? In the IHSA, the Illinois High School yeah. Association. So. As an emerging sport or as a sport, full-fledged? A full-fledged sport. Sport, yeah. So is that something that uh, has been happening over in Illinois? They've been playing From this for read, a while? Yeah, they've been playing it for, I guess, a year or two, yeah. Okay, okay. That, that's a new one, but, uh, you know, it, it seems like the, the sport is just gaining in popularity in general. So. Yeah. Interesting. So see if that trickles over the border. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's more than just... The powder puff game played during uh, homecoming week. Or... Right, right. Is that a fall sport then? Is that when they're going to? I would, as I would assume so. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, interesting. So, um, a lot of a lot of stuff, like you said, going on. Uh, we're going to start off in our first segment. We're going to talk about uh, wrestling and girls basketball, as those uh, sports are moving into the state round for the wrestling, and the uh, girls basketball will be moving into the semi state round. Uh, coming up here on Saturday, we've got uh, a couple of our teams that are going to be uh, participating in both of those uh, portions of the tournament. So let's start off with the Rochester Wrestlers. You were up at East Chicago last Saturday. You had a, uh, a great showing from Rochester trying to uh, punch some tickets down to Evansville as uh, they will be participating in the state uh, meet at Evansville this year due to the uh, Fieldhouse hosting the NBA All-Star game. Mm -hmm next weekend so tell us about what happened up there at east chicago well rochester finished in third place behind crown point and penn and they qualified five for the state finals that's the uh, most rochester's ever sent, uh, sent to state they sent four back in 2022 and 2023 this year they got five and it started with uh, grant holloway who finished fourth at 106 lane horn who was third at 126 uh, Brant Beck, who was second at 165, Alex Deming, who was fourth at uh, 215, and Brady Beck, who was second at heavyweight. So no semi-state champions, but five guys finished in the top four and were able to advance. Boy, Brady Beck and Alex Deming, the dedication you have to have and to go to state to make it to state once, and for them to go to state for the third year in a row, just tremendous for them. Uh, Brant Beck and Lane Horn are going for the second year in a row, and they're just sophomores. And Grant Holloway going as a freshman. And what an awesome story that was uh, to make it, uh, especially after having knee surgery uh, back in December. Well, I know Alex and Brady, you know, you said going for the third time. I know that this year they're up a weight class from last year. Uh, are they in three different – were they in lower weight classes the first time? I don't remember. Uh, no, they both made it to, to – let's see, Brady made it at 220 both in 2022 and 2023. He made okay. it as a heavyweight this year. Okay. Uh, Alex Deming at 195 in both 2022 and 2023 and at 215 this year. Okay. So they both moved up this last year, but they were in the same class the first two years yeah. that they went. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, uh, Grant Holloway was such a great story, especially because, you know, his, his brother Ethan came so close. I think Ethan got to the ticket round at semi-state three times. And never, never made it. And, you know, Ethan's been it's just a huge fan and uh, a huge supporter of Grant's, obviously. And, you know, and, of course, to have, to have Dad, Derek, right there, you know, sitting in an assistant coach's chair to, to run on his son. He, he wrestled a kid from Hanover Central. It's funny, you know, you think of 106-pounders and they all look tiny. This kid from Hanover Central was tiny. I mean, if he weighed 100, I'd be surprised. And Grant kind of towered over him and he beat him. He beat him on a tech fall, and then in this ticket match, he faced a kid from Rensselaer who was 43-2, and two, Colby Robinson, and Grant just dominated him. And that was, what a what a shocker that was. And Grant had not wrestled uh, Robinson at the Rensselaer uh, duels back in December because Grant was out with his injury. And Robinson, I think, didn't know what to expect and didn't know what hit him. It was 7 to nothing, and then by the second period, and then Grant finally pinned him, kind of bundled him up and pinned him, and 
that was just a hugely exciting moment for I think uh, for uh, especially the Holloway family because if you, if you saw uh, the picture, you know uh, Grant kind of points to the stands, and I was thinking, who's he pointing at? And then I didn't. Then I later saw his brother. Obviously, that's who he was pointing at, mm -hmm. and it was a great moment. Um, then Grant wound up wrestling Mason Jones from Lake Central in the semifinals. Got pinned in 30 seconds, and then got pinned again by Alonzo Chantia of Plymouth, who he had lost to twice earlier this year. So there were two out of the 16 106 pounders, there were two seniors, Mason Jones from Lake Central and Alonzo Chantia of Plymouth. And Grant had to face them back-to-back, -back, but thankfully it was after he had already qualified for state. But Grant talked about how he's got to get bigger and stronger in the future. But, yes, it's also true that it's pretty rare when you see seniors wrestling at 106. Yeah, And then yeah. face two in a row. Uh I noticed that I know that the Lake Central kid uh, is ranked number two in the state and was undefeated. So uh, pretty unusual that you see something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, Grant's going to state, and he uh, we'll, we'll see how he does uh, uh, this weekend. But uh, you know, Grant's a kid who's obviously he was just born into the sport, like a lot of these like a lot of these kids. I mean, his dad being a coach, his older brother doing it. Said you know his older brother's always texting him and stuff. It's it was funny seeing, and, and I did eventually run into Ethan, and Ethan's. Ethan's kind of grown up a little bit. So he's he's not into weight management as much anymore now that he's out of co uh, high school. And it was great to see him. He he was just thrilled for his brother as well. Mm -hmm. uh, at one twenty six, Lane Horn finished third. Uh, began his day with a pin over uh, over John Glenn, uh, and then it followed up with a pin over Portage in his taken match. And we we've seen Lane. I mean, it's just he's all business out there. He gets on top. He goes to that wing move. He turns you. And once he turns you, it came with a little bit of a half Nelson involved. Once he turns you, it's lights out, basically. Yeah. I mean, you're, yeah. you're just not getting up from that. And, I mean, he's just all business. And and it was, it was so impressive, again. I mean, Lane's maybe one of the best uh, wrestlers from the top position that you'll ever see. A lot of kids have trouble turning a guy. They're just hoping to ride a guy. Lane's going to do more than just ride a guy. He's going to he's gonna kind of get the measure of you and eventually going to turn you. And it's just basically, you know, and he's so... He's such a technician out there that once he gets on top and gets that first takedown, you're in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. And so going to state for the second year in a row, then he wound up uh, wrestling uh, uh, Landon Hawkins from Crown Point. He was ranked number one in the state in the semifinals. Great match. Um, again, both guys just trying to get the measure of each other. Looked like Lane was had a chance to get an escape in the second period. Again, you could tell Hawkins was what Hawkins couldn't really do much with Lane when he was on top. Uh, and in fact, for about most of the second period, he was just kind of hanging on Lane's back. Ha having said that, Lane, that couldn't have been too comfortable for Lane with him, especially carrying a 126-pound weight on your back for two full minutes. Mm -hmm. um, it was 0-0 after two periods, and then Hawkins got an escape to win 2 to nothing in the th or got, excuse me, got a reversal in the third period to win 2 to nothing. So Hawkins wound up winning that, but again, Lane was right there, and then Lane wound up beating uh, Bennett from uh, Penn, Three to nothing in the third place match. So, uh, and again, what everybody was saying afterwards was how did how did Horn and Hawkins wind up on the same side of the draw? That should have been a final, and instead they wound up wrestling in the semifinal. So Lane was third, but I think most people thought he was the second best guy there. So we'll see how he does at state again. Lane, what we didn't even know until much much later was that Lane. Yes, Lane made it to state last year, but he he did it with a torn meniscus. He was. He was wrestling in a bad wheel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's back now. And, and not only is he back, but he's better than ever. And I'm really curious to see how he does at 126 this time around, a healthier Lane Horn. And, in fact, you know, I was talking with Lane's dad afterwards, and he was kind of smiling like, hey, we're right where we need to be yeah. going into going into state. So, yeah. uh, and, you know, I mean, Travis was, you know, a great wrestler himself. Uh, you know, then moving on to uh, Brad Beck at 165, uh, you know, Brant was just, he, you know, he, again, uh, after the regional, and I know this is almost hard to believe because we're talking about Brant Beck, but Clint Garth thought he kind of looked tired. Hmm. He thought Brant Beck looked tired at the regional. Yes, he won the regional. He needed to take down with five seconds to go to beat the kid from, to beat a kid from Mishawaka and win um, his um, weight class. But, again, he was he was full of energy. And he was determined not to let that happen again. He pinned uh, Sapkowski from Highland in 52 seconds in his first match. And then he took on Lucas Anderson from Chesterton, who was a pretty solid kid, a sophomore. And again, it was just, just all he was just on top of him constantly. Takedown, escape, takedown, escape. 
just throwing him down all, all match, getting getting uh, back points. And he, he won that one on a technical fall, so that clinched his state ticket. Then he wound up wrestling Emilio Torado of Lake Central. Torado was kind of a was a junior, kind of a surprise to get to, to the state. Maybe he seemed a little satisfied that he had made it to state. Another tech fall from Brandt. And that got him to the finals against uh, Reinhardt from Crown Point. The key was ranked number one in the state. It was 0-0 after two periods. It was really just a tense match. Both kids trying to take the measure of each other, trying to find kind of an avenue. And eventually Reinhardt got an escape and then got a takedown and wound up winning 3 to nothing. Hmm. But uh, I think, that th- again, that's another one where I think Brand is ho- – I mean, if that's how Brand does against the number one kid in the state, then who else is going to – Right. Did he sh- should he be afraid of? Right. Because that was zero zero after two periods. So again, uh, Clint Gard talked about just in general with his team. We need to get more get more points early. If we can get more points early, that will force them to come to us uh, in the later periods. And then Alex Deming going to state for the third st- straight year, like we mentioned, uh, started his day with a pin of uh, Elmore from Maryville. And then the, the, the ticket match against Aiden Abad of Lowell was just scary because, you know, Alex was the was by far the aggressor, but Abad just kind of sidestepped Alex's attacks. And and, and it's just like you're looking at the clock, and you're looking at the clock, and it was 1-1. Each, each guy had an escape, and Alex just gonna, gets an escape with about six seconds to go in the match to win 3-1. Uh, he, finally, he finally caught up and got his legs. And, and got him down on the mat for the for the winning takedown to make it three to one. Uh, then Alex ran into uh, Jaden Bartosik of Hanover Central, a really tough kid. Uh, Bartosik wound up winning four to three, got a late takedown to beat Alex, and that put Alex in the third place match against Cole Shacoin of uh, McCutcheon. I think we had talked about Shacoin. His sister plays volleyball at Purdue, very athletic family, and Shacoin was ranked number two in the state, but he had lost to the kid ranked number one in the state in. Uh, Will Clark of Crown Point in the semifinal, so Shaquan wound up in, in the third place match, and he had, I mean, that was a dandy of a match. Lost nine to seven to Clark in the semifinals. I think he maybe took out a little frustration on Alex. Wound up winning twelve to seven. Got Alex for five takedowns. That is rare to see Alex taken down like that. Really, really quick. Hmm. Really athletic kid. Really went after Alex's legs, and uh, again, uh, you know, Coach Guard was a little bit disappointed with Alex, saying he was. He needs. He was a little stubborn. Needs to be coachable. Needs to be willing to make adjustments in the middle of a match. But Alex still going to state for the, um, you know, the, f- the third straight year, ranked number five in the state. But again, I think by far, at least at the two fifteen weight, uh, East Chicago was by far the toughest of the four semi states. Right. Then at heavyweight, Brady back going to state again. He had been battling an illness, been battling a little bit of a stomach flu. Um, beats uh, Raymond James from Maryville on a pin in the first round. And then uh, faces a tough kid in Col- uh, Foy from Hanover Central. Foy was tough. I mean, it was a battle just for positioning. Brady finally kind of outlasts him and wins three to nothing. Gets a takedown early in the match and put Foy kind of on the. You know, Foy had to maybe be attacking a little bit more than he wanted, and Brady was able. To, again, Brady's hard to take down, and Brady wound up winning three to nothing. That got him his ticket to state. Then he wound up facing Aramis McNutt from Highland. McNutt came in undefeated. A smaller heavyweight, like about 230, but just full, just all muscle, just a really good athlete. But again, uh, I think Brady's technical abilities and it's just his mat, his mat experience kind of pulled him out. He won 5-2. to two. That put him in an, uh, against, uh, this would be Paul Clark of Crown Point in the championship match. What a match! One and two, one versus two in the state to close out the semi-state. Everybody was watching. I went down to the, I went down to the floor. It was just an absolute, just battle. Just two gladiators going at it. Uh, Brady was down three to nothing. He gets an escape. He gets an escape late in the second period, which at the time didn't seem like much, but it turned out to be huge because that got him to three to one. And so now he's just either a takedown or a reversal away from tying it. He gets the reversal with like 20 seconds to go in regulation. Three all now, and it looked like he might have had uh, a near fall. He got. It looked like he was kind of leaning back. Got. It looked like Paul Clark's shoulder was touching the mat. Clint Guard argued for a near fall. The officials didn't call it, and we went to overtime tied at three. It looked like Brady might have had a takedown in the overtime. That would have won the match. 
It looked like Clark was able to hang on to Brady's leg. It looked like Brady, again, it came, it's a matter of the definition of positioning and who's on, is one guy on top, is one guy not on top, or are they essentially equal? Uh, Clint Garner went to the official for two separate conversations, both times the, and I think both times the, the two officials then went to talk with each other. Both times they shook their head no, and we went to a fifth period. Neither guy scored in the fifth period, so it came down to the sixth period, hmm. triple overtime, the ultimate tiebreaker, and Clark eventually gets an escape and then gets a takedown for insurance and winds up winning 6-3. to three. But having said that, it was an absolute battle, and again, could, these two guys could see each other again mm -hmm. in Evansville. In fact, it, it's we're, we're certainly hoping for it because right. anybody who saw that match will, will remember what they saw. Both guys just absolutely gave everything they had. Yeah. So, again, Brady finished his second. Again, Brady, Alex, Brandt, and Lane, none of them had lost a match all year until the semi-state, which gives you an idea how tough the East Chicago semi-state is. Well, yeah, that's the that's the one thing. You know, you, you talked about it, the semi-state at East Chicago, Rochester still able to put five through to state mm -hmm. through that semi-state. I mean, that is just right. amazing because – it is probably, like you said, the hardest semi-state in the state. Yeah, either that, either that, or Newcastle has the the Indy kids. So they would have been pretty tough, and I'm sure yeah. Evansville would speak up for themselves. But yeah, I mean, it, one of the toughest. One of the toughest for if sure. If Rochester was to come out of Fort Wayne, I think we'd be talking about more than five. I think yeah. we'd be talking about six or seven. Right. Right. Uh, what about a few of the kids that uh, made it to the semi-state but did not uh, get through? Yeah, a salute to the four kids who uh, were not able to advance. Um, it started with, uh, you know, uh, DJ Basham at 132. DJ, what a run to get to semi-state. He had never been to semi-state before, but he finally makes it as a senior. And not only does he make it, but he wins the regional at Penn. Mm -hmm. um, he beat, you know, he beat uh, Vargo from Penn in the regional semifinals, who was ranked h higher than him, but Vargo hurt his arm or hurt his elbow in the regional semifinals, so he beats him in an injury default like 20 seconds into the match. And then he winds up uh, upsetting uh, the Plymouth kid. We had, we had broadcast his match against Plymouth. He, he lost against Wright from Plymouth in the sectional final, and really that wasn't too competitive a match. The regional match was totally different. DJ dominated the match, won 8-2. to two. Just a great performance. Unfortunately, ran into Michael Turner from River Forest in the uh, first round of the semi-state and Turner got a pin uh, in the first period. DJ just really uh, struggled against Turner's style, and Turner was able to uh, cradle him in the first period and win that match. Uh, Wyatt Davis made it to the ticket round, lost to Christopher Bone from Munster. Bone was undefeated uh, on the season, really an athletic kid. Uh, was able to attack Wyatt's legs and win that match 6-1. to one. You know, again, he, he was ranked number 5, while Wyatt was ranked number uh, 15, I think. Or Bone was ring number, excuse me, Bone was ring number ten, and Davis ring number fifteen. Again, not nothing to be ashamed of, especially. I mean, Wyatt, you know, Wyatt looked dominant in his first match. Hit pinned Hanover, a bit pinned uh, Harrison, uh, pinned a kid from Harrison in twenty one seconds. Harrigees. So, again, uh, you know, I, and I know Coach Guard said later that Wyatt had been dealing with a lot of illness uh, later in the season. I know he had a shoulder uh, issue as well. So, again, Wyatt, uh, again, you know, won thirty matches this year and really. Uh, you know, again, is just a a great talent, and, and again, he'll be somebody to watch again next year. Uh, Declan Guard got to the ticket round, wind up facing Aiden Costello of Hobart, who is undefeated at rank number one in the state in the ticket round, and wound up losing on uh, a technical fall. Uh, but again, uh, Declan beat Prickle from Frontier in his first round match to get there. That was his 35th win of the year. He won eight matches last year, won 35 this year. Um, again, it's going to be Coach Gard talked about. He's just going to have to get bigger and stronger in the in the weight room. But again, Costello is a junior, and was just you know just a great athlete. And um, again, better days from Declan ahead. I don't think anybody quite imagined he'd get to the ticket round of semi state. Mm -hmm. And then um, Colin Weand, uh a heartbreaker of a lot. He, you know, he wins his first round match against Aiden Ziegler from New Prairie. That was an absolute battle. Uh, you know, senior versus senior, and he beats Ziegler. Gets a gets an escape and a takedown in the third period and wins six to three. And then in the ticket round, he faces Alexander Tatum from Hobart, a senior against a freshman. But Tatum was tough, and 
was able to kind of keep a forearm on his neck and keep Colin couldn't get that escape in the second period, which would have been huge. And then so at the start of the third period, he doesn't want to get – he gives um, – you know, you, again, Tatum chooses down to start the third period. So Colin chooses to go up neutral. So that's basically you're giving him a point. You're mm-hmm. basically giving him an escape. But you're betting that you can get a takedown. I think it was, I think it was the right strategy because – Tatum kind of wanted to roll around with Colin, and I think Colin wanted to be on his feet. And unfortunately for Colin in the third period, he just couldn't get that takedown, and Tatum was able to win one to nothing. Hmm. So I, I, I think if if Colin and Tatum had wrestled ten times, I think each would have won five. This was just one that Tatum wound up winning. Yeah, but a heartbreaker of a loss for Colin, who had a great senior year and got to, got to the ticket round two years in a row and didn't just didn't quite make state, but. Definitely one of my favorite kids to cover and, and, and watch wrestling. Yeah, about midway through last year, through uh, this year, I mean, he really just seemed like he was figuring things out, and yeah, he had a great uh, career. You can just see the confidence that yeah. he wrestled with, and yeah. it, it was it was great to watch. I mean, he had so many great moments on the year. Um, the win over Curry from Adam Central at Team State Duels was one was. You know, I don't think anybody had him winning that match, and that mm-hmm. was just a huge highlight. Once he won that match, it just seemed like the rest of the team kind of followed along. Yeah, and, yeah, it was a big uh, moment for them. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, you know, he had a great, great year. Just a lot of tough one ninety pounders. I mean, he he had a tough he had a tough weight class at conference, uh, but came back and wound up uh, winning uh, sectional, and was second at regional, and just uh, yeah, just a tough heartbreaker of a loss at, at uh, semi state. So uh, let's take a look here at uh, the brackets that uh, were drawn on Sunday for the state wrestling meet. We're just going to look at the half of the bracket that each one of uh, the Rochester wrestlers are participating in. So let's start off here and uh, take a quick look at Grant Holloway's bracket at 106. He's going to be wrestling Jensen Boyd of Delta, who is an undefeated freshman, and Boyd is ranked number one in the state. So hardly in... Not an easy draw. Obviously, Grant Holloway being a, being a fourth place finisher at East Chicago, and he was going to be somebody's first place finisher. And uh, Boyd has been dominant. Delta always good at always a really good program. Delta won the Fort Wayne semi state as a team, and Delta always seems to put out good lightweight with kids. One hundred six, one thirteen. They just pump them out. And Jensen Boyd is the latest one. So uh, we'll see how Grant does. But he's again facing an undefeated kid right off the bat. All right, and Lane Horn here. Uh, we'll take a look at the uh, the bracket for Lane. All right, I think he's pretty familiar with his opponent. He drew Cody Rolls of Jay County, who um, has lost 10 times this year. But Rolls is a tough kid, and is, I'm sure he's wrestled a very tough schedule. But, of course, Lane's wrestled a lot of tough opponents himself. Um, again, Lane is would, will, will certainly be favored in that match, and uh, if he wins that, if he wrestles Butt or Douglas, he'd be favored in that match as well. So, again, uh, you're looking at where, um, you know, Bennett from Penn is on the other side of the bracket. Hawkins from Crown Point is on the other side of the bracket. Hawkins got a real tough opponent. He got Mosier from Delta. That's a tough opponent for a, for a semi-state champion. So I think Lane's draw is, again, there's no such thing as an easy draw. Obviously, the possibility of facing Schaefer from Evansville Modern Day that would be a battle if it came down to that in the semifinals. But it would mean that you. But it would mean you'd make it to the semifinals. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's move over to Brant Beck. Yeah, Brant Beck wound up uh, drawing a very familiar opponent. He drew Levi Abbott from Cowan, a guy he's wrestled twice. That that almost never happens, where you wrestle, you draw a kid at state who you've wrestled already. Mm-hmm. But he drew Abbott, who's already wrestled twice and beaten twice. But the first match uh, at the McKee Invite back in Rochester back in December, that was that was a barn burner of a match. Brad Beck got a takedown with about one second to go to win four to three. Um, and then they wrestled again at the Team State Duels, and Brent won that one by injury default. That was that crazy match, which Abbott just could not patch up a bloody nose. I mean, they stopped the match like about seven or eight times to... Even put a big thing of gauze around his, the middle of his head. It was just weird. Hmm. He was bleeding that much. So, I imagine I would imagine that Abbott will come in with a chip on his shoulder. But we'll see. Again, I mean, Brant wrestled Abbott much better the second time than the first time. I think he was winning like five to one when the match eventually got called. So, uh, we'll see if if uh, Abbott can get on the inside and get a takedown. 
Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, Brandt allowed only one takedown the entire semi-state. He is not easy to take down because you have to be really quick to get to Brandt. So uh, if Brandt could get by that one, uh, Radebush from Bloomington South uh, would figure to be the guy, and Radebush is ranked number three, Brandt's ranked number five. That would be a dandy of a quarterfinal match, my goodness, on the for Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Myers from Belmont's on the other side of the bracket, uh, and uh, so was Reinhardt. Uh, but again, uh, you know, uh, Brent, you know, had to wrestle going from Crown Point in the first round at State, going one up winning one up winning State, and Brent was the only guy he didn't pin. So I mean. Uh, I, you know, so I, I mean, I, I think Brand's got a much better draw this time around, and uh, I, I expect him to be motivated. And you know, Brand, he, he's again, he's going to be, he's going to just come at you with a lot of energy, and I'm really, I'll be curious to see how uh, his opponents try and defend him. Yeah. Let's move over to uh, Alex Deming at two fifteen. Well, this is unbelievable. Um, Alex drew Jackson Weingart of Indianapolis Cathedral. Now you would think. Alex finished fourth at his semi-state, which means the Weingart won his won the Newcastle semi-state. So you would think, well, the guy who won a the guy who won his semi-state is ranked higher than the guy who finished fourth at his semi-state. Mm -hmm. No, that's not true. Alex is ranked number five, and Weingart's ranked number eight. Mm -hmm. So um, Alex should have a, would figure to have a shot to win this match, and again, that just tells you about how strong the East Chicago semi-state was at yeah. two fifteen. So uh, again. Not that a, a four seed has ever got an easy uh, draw at state, but this would be a, potentially a winnable match. And if you can get by that, um, you know, then, I mean, that Hinton versus Terry matchup is going to be a dandy as well. I know Rochester is very familiar with Hinton because he had wrestled Brady Beck at last year's semi state. So Rochester mm -hmm. knows all about Hinton, mm -hmm. but they also know all about Terry from Team State Duel. So they, they know both of those kids. So, um, Again, it's not an easy draw, and you got Will Clark is also in that half of the draw. Um, so we'll see how how Alex does. He was seventh last year at two fifteen. So he, he, again, he's he's wrestled at, um, you know, he he's wrestled at this level before. I'll, I'll be curious to see how he how he comes out and what he's been working on over this past week. Yep. And then uh, over to heavyweight, where Brady Beck will be uh, wrestling there. Right, and Brady draws Isaiah Kuhlman, who is a sophomore from Leo. Kuhlman is ranked number 20 in the state, and as we mentioned, Brady is ranked number 2. So you'd have to think Brady is going to be favored. Uh, again, not many so – again, it's, it's interesting, not many not many older kids make it at 106 and not many younger kids make it at heavyweight um, because of kind of the experience and then you need to be good at this weight. So you'd have to like – you'd have to like Brady's chances, again um, – Johnson from Center Grove is twenty three and one. He would be a potential quarterfinal matchup, and Johnson is twenty three and one against a pretty against what you sh I'm sure has been a really tough schedule. But I think he was injured earlier in the year, so he's only wrestled twenty four times compared to Brady's forty four times. And yes, uh, Popey from Plymouth is there a possible semifinal opponent. Popey finished fourth at East Chicago. They, he did not Popey and uh, Brady did not wrestle each other at East Chicago. They have wrestled three times this year. Brady winning all three, uh, but the Hastings kid from Noblesville, he's kind of looming out there. Uh, I know Brady's familiar with Hastings. I think they wrestled at State last year. Brady got by him, I think, by one point. So you'd have to think, uh, uh, you know, that those two are pretty familiar with each other. And then uh, McNutt is in the opposite side of the bracket along with Paul Clark. But Yeah. Should be some good stuff. Again, Val will be down at uh, Evansville covering all of the action for us here with RTC TV4. And uh, probably by the time you see this, a lot of these first round matches will be will be done. So keep keep an eye on the on Val's Twitter at valtsports.com or at valtsports on X, I guess, not Twitter. Yeah. Uh, for updates all day long from Evansville. Um, let's take a quick break here, and uh, we'll come back and we'll talk about the cast and Lady Comets who are going to be going down to Frankfurt on Saturday for a hopefully a couple games. We'll be right back here on Talking Sports with Val. RTC is partnering with the Fiber Gaming Network program. If you live in a zip code that RTC Fiber Communications provides service to, you can participate for free. The Fiber Gaming Network is affiliated with eSports and is offering cash prizes for competitions every week. 
If you have an account, sign in today and register for upcoming events. And if you don't, simply visit www.fibergamingnetwork.com and create a free account to get started. Are you ready to take your home's comfort to the next level? The Insulation Guys can evaluate your attic, walls, basement, and crawl space to determine where insulation can be added or upgraded. Our expert team delivers high quality insulation solutions, not only improving your home's comfort, but also lowering your energy bills. Call us today for a free quote at 574-223-3626 or visit us online at www.theinsulationguys.net. My name is Tasha Mitchell and I am a commercial lender for Alliance Bank. Behind me is the spreader I currently use to applicate dry fertilizer product. Very unexpectedly did I become a commercial banker. I've only been a commercial banker for about nine months and with my ag experience, it has really helped me. I would choose Alliance Bank because even though they have seven branches, they are a very community oriented bank. They give a lot back to the community and their clients are their top priority. Looking for a better way to incentivize your staff or provide them with custom apparel to boost morale? Allow the Winning Edge to set you up with a custom edge store tailored to your business needs. Whether you need supplies for your fundraiser or shirts with your business logo on them, the Winning Edge can help you set up an online one-stop shop. Call today at 574-223-6090 or visit their website at www thewinningedgeathletics.com. Welcome back here talking sports with Val. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the cast and lady comments, Val, coming off of uh, that great uh, sectional championship win. We didn't get a chance to talk a lot about that, but they defeated Tri-County over at South Newton for their first sectional championship since 1985 mm -hmm. for girls basketball. So, um, I, I think you, you put it best in your article that you wrote on the blog. You know, they had that refuse to lose mentality. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Addison Zippelman and, and Isabel Scales, the two seniors, uh, just kind of put that team on their back in that uh, championship game. And, boy, it was a dandy. The, the Tri-County Cavaliers, you know, they gave yeah. Keston their first loss of the season, you know. If you made a movie out of it. Yeah. You could almost because they were down by seven going into the fourth quarter and had to – had to beat a Tri-County team that just bedoubled them, especially with their defense. I mean, Tri-County is just very long and athletic, um, a team that just it was just hard to score on. And Cass was able to go on what uh, outscored Tri-County 12-4 to in the fourth quarter to win by one. So that would uh, set up a uh, very historic event for the Cass and Lady Comets, a home regional game so mm -hmm. uh, not only are they participating in the first uh, regional game that they've played since 1985 but then they get a chance to play it at home of course the regional format changed last year so you only have to win one game to uh, become a regional champion and right uh, Caston's hosted the regional for decades I <coughs> imagine there are Caston fans who just dreamed of can you imagine one day if we ever got to play yeah play uh, in that in that yeah but it, it was it was a, it was a little bit of a, an odd day, obviously, because with the new format, and this is the first time it happened because last year it was two one A regionals, but uh, they actually hosted the three A regional before mm -hmm. uh, their one A regional. So you had two three A schools coming in with uh, Benton Central and Norwell. So that was, you know, it was kind of you know there was some grumblings. You could hear people, you know, this is a small gym and everything, but. Honestly, the crowd for uh, the Cast and Bethany Christian game was much larger than the uh, the crowd was for Norwell and mm -hmm. for uh, Benton Central. So, um, with all that in mind, let's uh, let's go down to uh, the launching pad. And uh, Blair and Pete did a great job on the call on that one. You were up at uh, East Chicago on uh, Saturday, so I, I was, didn't get a chance to go there live. I was but, eating a bowl of soup and watching oh. you guys on on my phone it was it the atmosphere was just amazing mm -hmm. i mean it was everything you would expect from a home regional game that you know you never thought would happen it came through my phone yeah while yeah. watching it so let's let's take a look here as the uh the lady comets take the floor you can see three quarters of the uh the bleachers there on the far side were uh, filled with red uh, bethany christian had a, a you know a good contingent for a, a smaller christian school the 
a lot of times those private schools don't travel real well. Bethany Christian did. Right, uh, coming from Goshen, what about a little over an hour drive, I would imagine? An hour and a half at mm -hmm. least, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So the uh, you know the starting lineup, obviously the the four seniors. You can see Annie Harsh there, the fifth senior. She's been a key to this team all season long, and, and of course uh, Madison Douglas, the freshman. Um, you know what a what an addition to the team. You know we talked about her coming in as a freshman. Uh, she's made a an impact with with this team. You know she started off with that Argus game and just kept going. And I think the the key thing here you saw scales uh, the passing for the uh, uh, Lady Comets was just on point um, all night long. Yeah. Isabel Scales, you're going to see several really good passes from her. Another one there is Zippelman able to uh, drive the baseline. Right, and I talked with Josh Douglas uh, uh, yesterday, and he said that the passing is back to where it was early in the season. And uh, Yeah, you can see here Bell gets a, a beautiful pass on a cut to uh, Zippelman. And then, right. Scales finished with six assists in this game, by the way. Yeah, and that was another one there to uh, Alexa Finke. I mean, just... Hmm. She's obviously drawing the attention of the Bethany Christian uh, Bruins, uh, but able to uh, to find open teammates and good uh, good cuts there by uh, Finky and Zimpleman too. Right, Zimpleman led Cass with 14. She didn't hit a three in this game. Yeah, that and, was a and big we know, one we know that Zimpleman's Annie. a good outside shooter, but just wasn't needed. Yeah, and the thing I like about Douglas is she doesn't, and most of the time, doesn't try and overplay her hand. Right. Freshmen can can try mm -hmm. to you know do more than they are capable of. Uh, she's very disciplined as far as uh, usually kind of knowing where to draw that line. Yeah, that was that three point play by Scales to start the second half. That put him up by thirteen. That was after that big bucket toward the end of the first half. The eight point lead turned into a ten point lead, and then this is just again watch the ball movement. And Douglas drains a three from the top of the key, and all of a sudden it's a sixteen point lead in Bethany's and. Pretty huge trouble. I mean, they're. You know, Mariah mm -hmm. Stoltzfus, the uh, point guard for Bethany Christian, she missed some games, and you could tell she was not 100%. Uh, I, I think the, the leg was mm -hmm. maybe bothering her a little bit there, but, uh, you know, give, give the Comets a lot of credit in this one. I mean, they just came out. Uh, really, the, the end of the first half and the start of the second half and, and just kind of put this one away. Right. I mean, uh, Caston started the second half with a 10-0 run. I mean, Bethany needed Bethany needed to get off to the, a great start in the second half, and the exact opposite happened. It was mm -hmm. Caston who got off to a great start. It was a 20-point lead, and basically you were just kind of looking at the clock for their last, what, eight, nine, ten minutes of the game. Yeah. Uh, Caston wound up winning by 15. I thought Caston's defense was so on point. Uh, now, you mentioned this. Now, again, I, you saw Stoltzfus in, in person. So uh, what I what I saw on film is that, uh, Bethany needed to get uh, get Stoltz was a high ball screen to get her get her loose mm -hmm. to get her some space. Yeah, and Casson was ready for it because mm -hmm. they they just did a straight switch on every high ball screen. Yeah, and you know who's a good defender? We don't talk about her as a defender enough. Is Annie Harsh mm -hmm. because she was right there on every switch and they communicated so well. And as soon as Stoltz was, as soon as she f it was like, oh, I'm, okay, I got a high ball screen, and as soon as as soon as that happened, she got just swallowed up right away. Mm -hmm. And Casson just it was just a straight switch. It was just it, it wasn't anything fancy, just a man defense with a straight switch. And uh, Bethany struggled with it. I mean, kudos to Zoe Willems to score twenty. Mm -hmm. But she went six for eighteen from the field. It wasn't a, it wasn't an efficient twenty. Yeah. And I think Bethany is a team shot only twenty four percent. Yeah, you know, I was up at Argus earlier in the season when, when Argus and Bethany Christian played, and, and it was a different-looking Mariah Stoltzfus. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was 100% in that game, and you could tell that uh, she just wasn't able to go quite as hard and, and as fast. I mean, she didn't need the ball screens against Argus. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was able to just do it with her speed. And so that was, uh, you know, it is what it is, right? I mean, you got to right. deal with it when you when you get nicked up a little bit towards the end of the year. I mean, nobody's one hundred percent right at the end of the year, and so uh, you know, Casting able to get it done, and you know, with this new format, you just win one game and you're a regional champion. But that semi state is looming large there in the uh, the semi state draw. 
which is new since last mm-hmm. year as well. They added that to uh, what they're doing. Uh, came out on Sunday, and uh, so we got a chance to see, you know, how this semi-state and, and where, because we didn't know until Sunday where they were going to be playing either. Mm-hmm. And, Kind of had an idea, and, and actually I, I feel pretty good. I got all four of the classes right on where they would yeah. end up playing. Uh, and I do have that down on, on paper. So, um, you know, the uh, the 1A is going to be playing at Frankfurt, the, uh, you know, legendary Case Arena, the home of the, the Blue Chips. Mm-hmm. Um, Frankfurt seems to be a pretty good place for Caston to play semi-states. They uh, played the uh, softball semi-state there last spring and, and ended up winning that. But uh, I think they got a probably about as tough of a draw as you could get for uh, coming out of a semi-state. They've got number five Marquette in game number two. So you got Clinton Central taking on Union City, who's 14 and 12 in game number one. Right. Clinton Central is very close to home. Right, again, possibly could get a game where they don't have to put out a lot of effort. I'm not saying not a lot of effort, but they're going to have the easiest game of the first they, two. They beat Union, Union City during the regular season, seventy-four to thirty-five. Yeah. So, if you if you told if you told Clinton Central you can choose which of the four sites your semi-state can be played at, I'm sure they would have chosen Frankfurt. Oh yeah. And if yeah, you if it's you, in the same county, so they're very close to home. And if you would have told Clinton Central between Caston, Marquette Catholic, or Union City, which one of the three would you like to play? Yeah. I think they would have chosen Union City. Yeah. And and which game? Yeah. You know, game one, so you, yeah. you, you have the longer time between games. Um, you know, Caston, I kind of equate it, you know, back when when uh, uh, North White beat Marquette in uh, the 2016 mm. regional at Caston. You know, they had to expend so much energy against North White, and then Argus, you know, kind of had an easier game against Bethany Christian in that game, and, and then Argus kind of rolled in the championship. So it's going to be a challenge. If Caston can get past Marquette, Marquette's you know they're the real deal. Mm-hmm. Coming out of sectional fifty, they're they're a really good team. They're young, but they're really really good. Lenaya Davis leads Marquette in scoring. She averages nineteen a game. Marissa Pleasant is second on their team in scoring. She averages ten. Davis is a sophomore. Pleasant's a freshman. And the thing Davis is, uh, Davis is Davis and Pleasant are both five seven, and then Balling. Who's the third leading scorer? She's six feet, mm. and then they've got another five ten year old who starts for them. So this this might be this might be kind of like Tri County in terms of length and athleticism and just size. Mm-hmm. Uh, they will have a side. They will have a height advantage in this game. I don't think there's much doubt about that. Yeah. But will they have a strength advantage? That's mm-hmm. another thing. Yeah. Another thing you notice about Marquette Catholic is they trailed Triton by one in halftime of their sectional final. Came back to win that one by thirteen. They trailed. Uh, Morgan Township by five at halftime of the regional game at Winnemac last week. Came back to win that game by 11. So this is a, a second-half team, uh, just like Caston is. So they're they're not going to panic if they're down for as young as they are, which is mm. impressive. Right. Um, you know, Davis, um, you know, she's she averages 19 points a game. She's only hit 12 three-pointers the entire season. So she, she can hit a three, and Josh Douglas says he's looked at film and he says, boy, she's got a nice-looking shot, but she doesn't shoot the three very often. She's more of a slasher. She wants to get to the rim. And then uh, Pleasant is more of the outside shooter of the two. Uh, so keep an eye on, on her. Uh, but then another thing you notice about Marquette Catholic is they average 13 steals per game. So they are going to press and trap, no doubt. Yeah. In fact, Coach Douglas said it's going to be more like a half-court trap than a full-court press. Yeah. Marquette coached by Katie Culligan, who uh, you know won two state championships in seventeen and eighteen. Mm-hmm. So, experienced head coach as well for the uh, Lady Blazers. So, right, and she's really guided a young team. Uh, again, I, I mean, I know Davis had a good year last year, but I think filling in the spots around her, she's done a great job. But mm-hmm. in the from an experience standpoint, again, from a stri- physical strength standpoint, you'd have to like cast the chances from an experience. Standpoint, you have to like Caston's chances. Yeah, Marquette Catholic ring number five and Caston ring number seven, and they're very similar in the computer rankings as well. This one has down to the wire match up written all over it. But I think if Caston can protect the ball, it's going to be obviously, in, obviously in every game it helps to avoid turnovers. But this one seems to be especially important because Marquette Catholic wants to get on wants to get in transition. They do not want this game to be a half court game. Yeah. 
So let's say Caston does get past Marquette. So then they would have a possible, and we'll just we'll just go with Clinton Central because that's what we figured was going to be the matchup. Oh. Obviously, there's a lot of things going on there besides you know just being a, a you know two very good teams. You know Don Helmick, the head coach of the uh, Lady Bulldogs, uh, spent some time in Fulton. As former the head yeah, coach, former of, casting uh, coach, and in know, fact, Josh Douglas was an assistant coach yeah. under Don Helmick uh, during Don's final year at Caston. In fact, Josh Douglas reminded me that when he was the head coach at Riverton Park, and Don Helmick was the coach at Paoli, they went at they coached against each other Did twice. They? Okay, so they've known each other for quite a long time. So, again, uh, yeah, I mean, it's certainly somebody who Cast is very familiar with. Uh, and in fact, he's very familiar with the cast and kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't play each other during the regular season. They had that fantastic game uh, down in Michigan Town last year, in which right. Caston wound up winning by one. I think it was that Bailey Harness with the game-winning basket late, mm-hmm. uh, and Caston was down actually for much of the second half. So again, but we saw having seen Clinton Central again this year, they've gotten even better this year yeah. than they were last year. Yeah, you know, obviously Sarah Parkinson, the big the big man inside. You know, she is. She's not just inside player. She can go outside, and she's a really good passer as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Davison, the the point guard. I mean, she's just as gritty as they come. Uh, I think the matchups. You know, Parkinson with Scales, Davison with uh, Douglas. I mean, the the matchups look to be. You know, there's going to be a lot of those game within a game kind of things yeah. going on with those matchups. Yeah. Um, Obviously, hopefully, that's the the matchup we get on the evening game on Saturday. I would really love to see those two go at it for a chance to to play down in Indy the next week. So, two games away for the Cast and Lady Comets. That would be that would be a, another movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, the, if the comeback against Tri Tri County is a movie, then that would be another movie. Yeah, it'd be uh, the second chapter of. Uh, actually, this is this is like the third or fourth chapter with this team. I mean, what yeah. they've done not only on the basketball floor, but. You know, obviously going back to the spring on the softball field. So mm-hmm. um should be an interesting one. The uh, Lady Comets will tip off around noon from Frankfurt for game number one versus Marquette. Um, we will uh, we'll be there watching, but the IHSA has those games. It will be on IHSATV.org, and uh, there is a pay-per-view charge for that. $12 for the game, but you can buy – all of the semi states for for twenty dollars, so you can watch all three of the games from Frankfurt, and, and plus all of the other you know the other three north sites plus all four of the south yeah. sites. That's really a pretty good deal. Right. So I imagine they'll start the game exactly at noon, or as close to noon as possible. I even if the first game were to end at like eleven twenty, I don't know. Would they wait until noon? Well, normally on regionals they don't. When they used to do the two game regionals, they because there's no I know they yeah. did last Saturday due to the fact, obviously, you got to get people off the court and all that stuff. But for I'm a semi state where you're televising it, pay per view statewide, yeah, kind of wondering if they might stick yeah, I don't very know. tight to I don't that know. schedule. Yeah, we'll find out, I yeah. guess. Yeah. So, but uh, you know, sometime around noon mm-hmm. is what the projected tip off is for that one. So, uh, good luck to the Lady Comets as uh, they are two games away from uh, playing for another state championship. Uh, with this group of girls. It's pretty amazing what they've mm-hmm. done. We're going to take another quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk some uh, Rochester boys basketball, Rochester swimming, and then uh, get into our other schools uh, as we continue talking sports with Val here on a Thursday uh, slash Friday. We're filming on Thursday, but you'll see it here on Friday. So we will be right back. Evans Agency is here to match you with the best insurance solutions that fit your needs. Whether you need coverage for home, business, auto, or life, Evans Agency will make sure you have the protection you need no matter what life throws your way. With a heart and a hand for friendship, Evans Agency is here for you. Call 574-224-6988 or visit online at www.evansagencyllc.com. Here at Timbercrest Senior Living Community, residents and independent living are able to enjoy an active lifestyle and a beautiful campus. With plenty of activities, including walking and biking paths, fitness classes and social events, there's always something for residents to engage in to benefit their mental, physical and spiritual well-being. Contact us today to schedule a tour and discover the active lifestyle and beautiful campus our residents enjoy every day. Say hello 
into a whole new world of growing possibilities with Nutrient Ag Solutions. Let the experts at Nutrient Ag Solutions help you realize the highest crop yield with the most sustainable solutions possible. Stop by their local location just east of Fulton or call at 574-857-3555 or visit online at www.nutrientagsolutions.com to see how Nutrient can help you. New Holland Rochester knows that farmers need equipment they can trust and rely on. That's why for over 125 years, New Holland has been innovating to develop the best and most sustainable products available for our customers. Check out our full fleet that includes our lineup of small compact tractors online at www.NewHollandRochester.com or stop in at one of our locations in Rochester or Logansport to see how we can serve you. Welcome back here Talking Sports with Val. And uh, let's talk a little bit of the Rochester swim team, the boys' sectional uh, prelims going to be happening um, as we're filming, it'll happen tonight, but it'll be happening on Thursday. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the possibilities of getting some boys to uh, Saturday. Yeah, I think Jake Cipher is going to be definitely favored to get to Saturday. Um, Jake has usually done the distance freestyle events when it's when I mean, again, Jake can swim any event, but I think he's typically done the distance freestyle events. So I would imagine he's going to do the 200 free and the 500 free again. Uh, but again, he can do any event. Um, you know, Wes Steininger, his his best event seemed to be the Butterfly and the uh, 200 IM. But you know, Wes is he's really good at those distant at those uh, sprint events too. He can do the 50 free if you needed him to do that. Um, it certainly, I, I, I certainly uh, would not be surprised if if Wes made it to Saturday, and made it to a sectional final on Saturday. That is, and I expect Jake to make it in two sectional finals. Uh, the other kids, you know. Um, you know, Spencer Backus has, uh, you know, the backstroke has been something that he's been good at, or, uh, you know, certainly he would be ha have the, po or I think the back, the, uh, he would be a possibility uh, to make it to a final. Uh, I would expect Reese Johnson and Lane Shank to be swimming on Saturday. I don't know if either of them will make a sectional final. I think maybe more likely a consolation race for those two, but I, I definitely expect them to, uh, to make it. Uh, and then, uh, Tanner Reese, I would expect him to go uh, to make it to a sectional final. He's also a distance freestyler. It's possible Rochester could have two distance freestylers in the finals with him and Jake. Uh, but again, Tanner's another kid who can swim just about any event. Tanner's had a great year, had a little bit of an injury uh, earlier in the year, but it sounds like he's healthy. Again, the team hasn't swam in two weeks. They've been just on this taper. They haven't, they haven't swam since the Tuesday of girls' basketball sectionals week. Mm -hmm. So they they take it easy this time of year, uh, from a you know they 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 ease up on the mileage. I, I talk with Wes Steininger. They don't ease up on the weight room. Mm -hmm. They continue they continue to lift, but and do some of their land training. But yeah, we'll see how they do. T uh, we'll see how they do, and I, I would expect at least two of the relays to qualify for the final, if not all three. Yeah. Uh, what about some of our other uh, local swimmers that'll be in uh, at Warsaw oh, Tippecan as well? Tippecanoe Valley is going to there really loaded and ready for for a big meet with Marcus Smith and with Isaac Whetstone and with Carson Parker, their big three. I mean, Marcus has uh, made it to state, what, in seven events in his career, I think, already. Uh, you'd have to think he's going to, again, he can do just about anything. The butterfly seems to be his forte, and also that 200 IM. He can go under two minutes. If he can go under two two minutes of the 200 IM, uh, that's kind of a rare error. Not many people can do that, and uh, again, he's he is definitely the man to beat in that event. Uh, he's done. He made it to state last year in the backstroke, but he can do the butterfly as well. So, who knows? Uh, he can do either. So, I wouldn't be surprised if he made it to state in either event. Uh, and then the relays, uh, though, you know what? I, Valley probably will not do a 400 free relay, at least from what we saw during that dual meet against Rochester earlier in the year. We expect them to go to go um, to with the 200. Uh, medley relay and the 200 free relay and valley will have a very very good chance of making it to state in both of those events when you talk about smith and parker and whetstone again mm -hmm. isaac whetstone's another kid who can swim again he and he and uh jake cypher have kind of that friendly rivalry in the distance freestyle events but isaac can swim a sprint too if you need him to mm -hmm. and then uh 
Pioneer. We'll see about Pioneer. Uh, I know uh, uh, Austin Brooks had a really good year. Uh, you know, a couple of other guys. I mean, Pioneer won the uh, won the Hoosier North Championship, so they should be a very competitive team as well this week at Warsaw. Yep. All right, so good luck to all the swimmers. Uh, prelims Thursday night and the uh, finals then on Saturday, diving finals on Saturday. Right. Uh, diving prelims and finals on Saturday. Right, and yeah. you have to think Peyton Brooks is going to be in the mix to mm-hmm. finish in that top four and make it to diving regional. Yeah, the diving does have to go to a regional next week. The, right. Uh, the regional is Tuesday at Valpo. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, we'll see again. Peyton's had a great year. I mean, yeah. he has really, uh, I mean, he. He gets a lot of height off that board, and he, um, again, I think he's picked up his degree of difficulty as well. So we'll see how he does. Yep. But you know, I'm sure Culver Academy has somebody. There's no doubt that you do. Yeah. Seems like they always do. And Warsaw yeah. probably does as well. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the uh, Rochester boys basketball team as uh, we speak. They set at eight and ten. They've got a big game coming up on Friday night at Peru. So eight and ten, they are zero and four in their last four. Still sitting at four and three in the conference. I mean, they're they're out of the mix for conference, but uh, they, um, you know, they're still sitting pretty good conference wise. So this game at Peru is going to be a big one. Um, let's take a look here at the uh, the highlights from the game the other night, uh, as they were uh, well, as last Friday as they hosted Wabash and boy. Shades of uh, the game from last year at Wabash, um, pretty similar, you know, throughout as far as Wabash had a big lead, Rochester comes back. Mm-hmm. Only thing was they were not able to come all the way back like they did last year at Wabash. Right. Wabash, I guess, had maybe too big of a lead. Uh, here we go with Owen Prater had one of the best games of his career, maybe the best game of his career. Uh Talk, you know, it was interesting talking with the guy, with the guys afterwards. Guy Owen felt that he he would have that size advantage inside, and he, you know, when Rochester would give him the ball in the post, he just continued on the attack. Uh, the only problem is Wabash shot the ball just spectacularly well, and that again they've got three great three point shooters with Grant Ford and uh, Trevor Daughtry and Isaac Wright, and when you, it's just a lot of court you have to defend when you got yeah that's daughtry there you and know, then daughtry's quick enough and, where he can break, oh. break you down off the dribble as well yeah and wabash led 19 to 13 after one quarter Again, this was a gorgeous pass on this fast break by drew bowers to owen prater for a layup i mean that was a very tight window in which you got the pass in uh kaiser there with a the nice that was jonas kaiser yeah. jonas has really played well of late kind of in that sixth man role or seventh man role Note on Jonas Kaiser, I did not realize you said uh, his cousin was there watching one of his games, the uh, Mr. Football, Jack Kaiser, and, right. and Jonas are, are cousins. Right, Jonas's dad and Jack's dad are brothers. Okay. So, uh, beginning, they hit a three late in the first half to go up 40 to 28. And again, it was much of the same in the third quarter. Again, for you know, Ford's a guy I w- we've always you know again, Daughtry and Wright have over a thousand points each, and Ford scored over eight hundred, and Ford set the school record for three pointers made. Mm-hmm. But Ford now he can score off the dribble as well. But again, after it got to fifty five thirty four and then fifty eight thirty seven, and then the comeback started. Yeah, I mean it looks like a Wabash just had this thing wrapped up, and right, uh, Tanner Reynolds didn't score at all in the first half of this game, and. Uh, Coach Rob Malco said they had a discussion at halftime with Tanner about being more aggressive. A discussion was the term he used. <laughs> discussion, I love that, yeah. Uh, I'm sure it was mostly Rob, uh, Coach Malco, doing the discussing. Yeah. And uh, Tanner doing the uh, listening. And then Bowers hits that three. That gets it down to nine. And then they hit another three. I think that was was that Reinerts. And they get it down to six at 67-61. And they were down by 21. And then here's Reinerts with a three. And that makes it a five-point game. And there would be another three by Reiners, I think, from the right corner. And this makes it 70-67. to 67. They were down by three. They used their final timeout at this point. 
And the problem just wasn't just that they were out of timeouts. The, pro- the bigger problem was that uh, Wabash had fouls to give, so they could just kind of play with the clock. And kind of similar to what they ran into with Lewis Cass a little bit, yeah. where they were trying to get a shot off, and Lewis Cass just you know continued to use right. the fouls. When you're out of timeouts and the other team has fouls to give, you're just the clock is just kind of becomes your enemy at that point. And Wabash was able to hang on and win seventy-two to sixty-seven. Yeah, but uh, certainly, you know, it was, it was interesting. I mean, talked with, I talked with Paul Wright, the Wabash coach, afterwards, and he, you know, he was very complimentary of of Rochester and how they came back. And he goes, we, he goes, we weren't, he goes, we weren't trying to take our foot off the gas, but you know, just Rochester, you know, but again, Rochester just made a lot of great shots there uh, late. But I, again, he, he said they weren't trying to take their foot off the gas. It was just kind of the way things turned out and. Uh, you know, he had seen he had seen Owen Prater before, but he hadn't seen him score like that on the post. And Prater wound up scoring twenty three. Yeah, and then seventeen from Bowers and twelve from Reinerts, along with ten rebounds. So that was Friday night. Tuesday, the uh, Zebras hit the road again to uh, non conference uh, action at Triton. It's a Triton team that's uh, having a pretty good year, even without Cole Shively. Um, in uh, Triton would end up getting the win, sixty six fifty six. Yeah, you know we've seen like we've seen North White play this year, and they're a one eight team, mm-hmm. and we've seen Triton play, and they're a one eight team, but they're two totally different types of one mm-hmm. A teams. On the different end of the spectrum from one A. <laughs> right, especially when you talk about like physicality. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are not a lot of one A teams that have guys who can guard a Tanner Reiner, who's six two, six three, and so strong and athletic. Yeah. But Dante Workman did a pretty nice job on him. I mean, Tanner did have uh, 13, but it wasn't an efficient 13. And then, you know, um, in terms of guarding Owen Prater, well, they had, I mean, they saw the film against Wabash, and they put Tanner Witt Hoyo on him. And Witt Hoyo at, you know, six, kind of similar build to Owen, kind of six feet, but kind of sturdy. Mm-hmm. And really did a nice job. And once Owen got going, they put Witt Hoyo on him and, Again, Tan- Owen just couldn't get as good a position as he would have liked mm-hmm. on the inside. And then uh, the guy who did such a nice job on Drew Bowers was their backup point guard, and that was Landon Patrick, the sophomore, who really gave them some energy off the bench. I think he had like three or four steals just in the second quarter alone. Rochester got off to a good start. They were up 16-11. to 11, But Rochester committed, I think, nine turnovers in the second quarter. Mm-hmm. And Triton scored 28 points in the second quarter, and a lot of those were just fast breaks. Off the turnovers, and then they, on top of that, they've got a Trent's got a really good three point shooter in Gage Riffle. He just kind of hangs out in the corner and just shoots those corner threes, and he is deadly. And Triton led by 11 at the half at 39 28. Rochester then played a lot better in the third quarter, and they, and they started forcing some turnovers. They got it back down to two at 47 45, but Triton got two buckets high post workman to Whit Hoyo for layups. It went from 47 45 to 51 45. They gave him a six-point cushion going into the fourth, and they wound up pulling away, winning by ten. Yeah. So that sets up a uh, road conference game for the Zebras going down to Peru. Both teams coming in at four and three in conference play. Um, Peru is is always just a tough place to play, and and you know they're right. they're a pretty good team, obviously led by uh, Ross and Rector. Uh, pretty two really good seniors there for the uh, Tigers. And. Now Rochester did beat Peru at home last year. Now they have to travel to Tiger Arena, where they have struggled for. I mean, Rochester has not won there in the TRC era, and in fact, I don't think they've won there in over twenty years. There were a lot of close games back in the Grimm and Barnett days, which they I think they lost by one one year and by two the the other year. Uh, they've just had a lot of frustrations at Tiger Arena. They lost what forty seven forty five when uh, Quinn Stasiak and Grant McCarter mm-hmm. uh, were there. So. Uh, this has been a tough place. To, when that, that was their junior year back in 2020. So Rochester's had a lot of trouble at Tiger Arena over the year. Let's see how they do. Again, Rector is averaging 18 points and nine rebounds a game, and Ross is averaging 11 and I think around seven, or, or excuse me, about 12 or 13 and seven rebounds. And then Xavier Turner has really had Eldridge has had a really nice year for them as well. Not not a lot of people talk about Eldridge, but he's had a great year. I think he's averaging around 13. And then Xavier Turner's had a nice year, averaging around eight or nine. Yeah. And you talk about strong kids. I mean, Ross and Rector. Obviously, we saw them with what they did on the football field. I mean, they're they're strong, <laughs> strong, just great athletes. Yeah, just yeah, tremendous athletes. So, 
So it's, uh, it's going to be a tough one, but uh, you know, like you said, it's it's been a tough place for the Rochester Zebras to go down to Tigerina. We'll see what they can do then on Friday. Then they go back home on Tuesday with a uh, OD Bobcat team coming in at four and fifteen. Watch so. out for Carson Matthew. He's six six, um, and he's re- he's a much. I liked I liked I like kind of what I saw from him last year. He's much better this year. He's really kind of. Um, refined his moves down to the post, and he can he can even hit to about a 15 foot jump shot. He's yeah. a nice player. Yeah. And th- those those two guards, Swanson and Frazier, I mean they're 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 veteran kids. So it, um, it, it you know th- and they play hard. I mean it, it won't be easy. Yeah, seems like they're a, a better team than four and fifteen would indicate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing about OD is that they struggle shooting from the outside. Mm-hmm. That's really been kind of their main issue. Yeah, this day and age, it's kind of uh, hard to win games if you can't hit from the outside. Right, yeah. right. So, all right, let's take another quick break. When we come back, we'll talk Argus Dragons and uh, move on from there. Mike Anderson in Rochester is here to set you up with a new set of wheels. From coming on the lot to driving off in your new dream car, Mike Anderson strives to give you the smoothest dealership experience. Not only that, but Mike Anderson in Rochester is here to lend a hand with their service center to keep your ride running. Stop on in for a test drive or call today at 574-223-2711 to see how Mike Anderson in Rochester can steer you in the right direction. Since 1974, Steve Moore Agency has provided the City of Rochester with customized insurance solutions that will fit your needs. With a variety of coverage policies for business, home, auto, life, and more, Steve Moore Agency is sure to cover all your insurance needs. Call now at 574-223-3010 or stop on in at 602 East 9th Street to see what Brody Moore at Steve Moore Agency can do for you. At Webb's Family Pharmacy, we strive to provide our community with a better alternative. We respect the many choices our patients have when it comes to health care needs. When they choose us, we go above and beyond to offer them personalized service and care that will consistently remind them of why we are a superior choice to other pharmacies. Pharmacy care should be proactive when possible. It should be customized to patient needs. It should strive for better health outcomes. It should help manage costs. At Webb's Family Pharmacy, our mission is to provide the pharmacy care you deserve. Fulton County REMC is proud to offer the Operation Roundup Charitable Giving Program. Through Operation Roundup, Fulton County REMC is able to give to local organizations and communities by simply rounding up your monthly bill and donating the change. Since its inception, Operation Roundup has generated over $50 million in charitable donations throughout 260 electric cooperatives. To learn more about this great program, visit www.FultonCountyRMC.com or call in at 574-223-3156. Welcome back here Talking Sports with Val. Let's talk some Argus Dragons boys basketball. The boys sitting at 9-9. Nine and nine. Of course, the, the big one everybody wants to talk about, the bell game as the Culver Cavaliers were at Phil Waybright Gymnasium last Thursday. Thursday for the annual bell game and uh, as typical Val the crowd was loud and uh, and frequent there was a, uh, a great crowd there for the bell game and Argus trying to hold on to the bell for uh, yeah uh, Culver brought a great crowd with him to Argus um, it, it really turned into kind of you know we were kind of wondering about this point guard duel between Jack Rogers and Sean Richard and it was really kind of manifesting itself early in the game. Culver, I think, got off to a really good start. David Height got off to a really good start. And Culver led, what, 10-2 to two early in the game. You know, Argus had only one day to prepare for this game, but they were able to, I think, do better against uh, Culver's uh, zone trap. But that three-pointer by uh, Jack Rogers early made it 15-6. to six. Culver led by nine early. But much of this game was about Sean Richard and his free-throw shooting. Yeah, he hit a couple. <laughs> and then he hit a couple more. Right. And then a couple more. Again, because Sean is, I mean, first of all, he's pretty aggressive. I mean, first of all, he's strong. And second of all, he's aggressive in terms of how he, how often he drives to the basket. 
Dragons would shoot 32 free throws in this game and hit 27 of them as a team. So yeah. not yeah. only Sean, but uh, the team was hitting them as well. Yeah, I think this might be the key scenario in this game, this early early second quarter uh, period of time. Uh, was that Stoltz with a put back, and Argus led 22-21. Yeah, even on the on the one miss, mm-hmm. they get the offensive rebound and the putback. Yeah, Kenyon Bell, well, he had he only four points, but boy, they were highlight film worthy. I think we had them all four of them on your highlights there, on our highlights here. Uh, he hits a couple of tough jumpers in the lane. Uh, that was a three. I think that was Rogers that got him within two. Uh, third quarter. Three pointer that was height. I think that got Culver within one. That was a three pointer by Makai Austin out of the corner. That was the only three pointer Argus made the entire game. Culver hit eight threes. Argus hit one. Well, so, the the Argus freshman though, man, mm-hmm. they came up big. I mean, just very impressed with with Belden and Austin. Yeah. Uh, was that Adria Guasp who hit a three? Yeah, he was kind of quiet there yeah. early, but uh, kind of came alive a little bit in the second half for the Cavaliers. That was a tremendous pass by Rogers on the fast break to get it to height, and it was it was down to two. But this was just a huge play. Austin with a steal and a layup. And that tough was, finish. You say layup? That was not a layup. That was yeah. a strong finish at the rim. Yeah, I mean that was tough. Yeah, they would get back within 57-50 on that three-pointer. Was that Guasp again? Uh, then Argus was able to close it out from the foul line. And they were able to win it 62-52. to That 10-point margin of victory represented their largest lead of the game. So it was a close game pretty much throughout. Mm-hmm. But uh, 28 for... Uh, Sean Richard and Luke Stoltz came off the bench for 19. It was it was a weird situation. I yeah I know when I went down and got the starting lineups and uh, Joe Kindig you know gave me the numbers. I'm like wait a minute what? Because Luke was yeah. not listed as a starter. And he's like that's what they gave me. And even even in the uh, announcements for the starters, Luke goes out there and he's like wait a minute what? Yeah. <laughs> and they had to they had to go with uh with what was in the book. So what was in the book. Yeah. So yeah, Luke Luke came into the game 14 seconds into the game. Yeah. Yeah. It was a it was a clerical error by coach Breeden, I yeah. think. Yeah. So uh, I do want to thank Kate Johnson, my intern here for uh, putting that uh highlight package together. Yeah. Did a really good job on that. Right. And I think Luke had what 19 to go with the 28 from Richard. Yeah. Made the bench points look good though. Yeah, made the bench points <laughs> look good, yeah. So uh, the uh, the Dragons now um, will go to Judson on Friday yeah. night. We should mention they followed up. They beat Clinton Christian 54-34 on Saturday, and then they beat South Central 66-62 in overtime on Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, Richard and Stultz had 22 each against Clinton Christian, and against South Central, Richard had 26, and Stultz had 25. Yeah. And that's uh, and Helms had eleven. Uh, Helms had eleven against South Central. Yeah, so they, they go to a, they go to Judson on Friday night. Judson been struggling a little bit as of late, so we'll see what happens there. They are still twelve and seven, but uh, yeah, you know they've they've lost a few games. That, Judson coming off a win over Culver on Tuesday. Yeah, um, and then they ha- they host North Newton on uh, Saturday. I don't believe they've played North Newton in the regular yeah. season. You know, I was talking with Coach uh, Breeden. After the Culver game, I said, you got room for another game if you want, right? And is that correct? He goes, yeah, it's correct. And he, he didn't want to be – he was kind of noncommittal, but I, he didn't rule it out. And so he wound up getting North Newton in the past few okay. days and threw that game on the schedule okay, as well. Okay, so they so added that. That was that. a very recent add. Okay. So I know North, North Newton has that uh, Evan uh, – Gagnon, who I think we saw as a freshman three years ago, yeah. and now he's a senior. Oh wow! And he's a he had I think thirty five against South Newton the other night. So yeah, yeah, he'll be a, he'll be a tough stop. And that was at, and of course they got to face McDaniel and North Judson on Friday night. So he's he's kind of uh, uh, Stoltz esque size wise, isn't he? If I remember right, yeah, he's yeah, tall, skinny, yeah, like kid. six four, six five. Yeah, 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 and then finish off at home on Tuesday with Jimtown. Uh, so. 
yeah, enough a nice little schedule there to finish off. Uh, and Jim, uh, Jim Town's playing real well. Jim yeah. Town started the year zero and five, and they're now I think eleven and nine. Eleven and nine, yeah. And uh, Jim Town is they won like four of their last five. Their only loss was at Valley yeah. by seven. Yeah, they've got that uh, Faye, who's a really good three point shooter. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I hadn't mentioned yet, the uh, boys' sectional draw coming up on Sunday. Yeah, So 5 o'clock uh, Sunday, yeah. Yeah, so we'll find out uh, who these teams will be playing. Of course, uh, Argus will be headed to Triton for sectional play. And mm-hmm. then uh, Cast and Comets, um, you know, we didn't talk a lot, but they, they went to Argus before uh, the Clinton Central or Clinton Christian game and uh, won by one up there, uh, 45-44. What a great win that was for yeah. Cast. I mean, they have not had a lot of success at Phil Waybright Gymnasium over the years. They had lost to Argus eight years in a row, which it was like I had forgotten about that. I mean, mm-hmm. I thought I thought Cast had pulled out one of those, you know, one game or a couple games against uh, Argus. Well, you know, they had lost eight years in a row, and Carl Davis had never beaten them since he had become coach. Of course, they had... Chris, I'm still angry they were supposed to play each other in the 2020 region. Oh. It didn't happen. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, um, so that was a really great win, especially coming off a loss to uh, Triton, you know, three days earlier. And then Kasten get, uh, beat North Jets on 36-32 on fr- uh, follow that up. So another nice win. Yeah. So, yeah, big conference win there. The uh, the Comets three and two in the conference, despite being nine and ten overall. Let's take a look here. We got some highlights from that game with North Judson. Okay. Yeah, this was the n- night before the girls, some uh, girls regional. So Caleb Wilson put this one together. So we'll see how this looks here for the uh, highlight package here. I'm letting the interns do some of these. The freshman Lane Hook, I mean, he continues to uh, impress. He's had some up and downs throughout the year, but uh, he's going to be a good one. Yeah. I think what was impressive about this game from a casting standpoint is they really, North Judson's physical, and they they did get, they have gotten Quinn Bales back, and you know, it gives them another big body. I was be curious to see how Casting would do against the physicality. They, they handled this very well. They got up to a great start in this game. Judson's really kind of struggled to score a bit of late. This is a nifty little move there, a reverse layup off of the swing book. Right. Uh, Hook would lead Caston in scoring, but that was that was Zyder hitting a three from the corner. And again, Caston, it was they always seemed to hit that big perimeter shot when they needed. Was that Yaden that hit that three? Yeah, Yaden's been playing a lot better. He, I don't, I don't remember ever seeing him shoot a three. I was like, wait, yeah. man, was that Grant? I think so. And yeah. Again, Casting will throw it over the top of the North Judson defense, get a layup. Again, Judson's been kind of the, the kind of a measuring stick for Casting in the conference. They had a huge win over them two years ago when they won when they won the conference. And then Judson, after struggling offensively, they would get hot here late in the game. They would get it down to 36-32. But Cass was able to throw it over the top and run out the clock, and they would win at 36-32. So a really good win for the Comets. Yeah, a big win at home. You know, you always want to win your home games, and especially when it's a conference game. Right. But then Lewis Cass came to town on Tuesday night, and Lewis Cass pulled out a 48-43 win. Second time Caston has lost to Lewis Cass this year, also lost to them. Uh, by four in overtime in the Cass County invite. So that's got to be frustrating because I know Caston has struggled for a long time against Lewis Cass. Mm-hmm. To actually play them close twice but to not pull out either one was disappointing. Yeah. But Lewis Cass earned it at the foul line. They went 15 for 16 mm-hmm. to win by five on the road. Yeah, And L.J. Hillis was 10 for 10. Thank your free throws. Yeah, and we yeah. L.J. Hillis had struggled when we saw him play against Rochester from the line. Apparently he got into the gym and figured it yeah, out figure, because he went 10 for 10 against Caston. Figured it out. So the Comets, couple of big yeah. uh, conference road games coming up Friday mm-hmm. night. They travel to LaVille. LaVille nine and ten, but they're four and one in the conference. And then uh, they go to uh, Winnemac on Tuesday. Uh, Winnemac's got nine wins as well, but they're only one and four in the conference. Right. Um, LaVille's been kind of an up and down team. Got a nice win over Westville the other night. 
Grant Yadon has been the cast of players really come out lately. He's going to be matched up against Michael Good of mm-hmm. LaVille. Mm-hmm. Similar, both guys physical, blue-collar type, um, Both, but both good athletes, too, mm-hmm. at the same time. And then... Uh, Hot, and then, of course, the guard matchup is going to be great with Zarnecki and Plummer against Zyder and Stinson. I mean, yeah. that is going to be a really fun matchup. Uh, you know, Caston won at Laville two years ago, which was a really special win for them because they have really struggled against Laville otherwise. So I'm curious to see how this game turns out yeah. uh, from a matchup standpoint. Yeah. Uh, Hook could be the uh, deciding factor right. there a little he, bit. He could be. Uh, you know, Laville might get a little more make me get a little more scoring off the bench when they go to Edison. But I mean, caston has got you know with Evans, he can hit the three two, and and you know Gavin Molenkov has moved into the starting lineup. Uh, I'd be curious to see uh, how the how Cast will match up uh, uh, defensively, uh, or or Cast just plays will play will they play some zone? Mm-hmm. Um, that has to be a possibility, but. You know, yeah, both teams nine and ten. It's kind of hard to get a read on the Laville team. The times I've seen Laville, they look really good, but they lost that. They lost the championship game in the by county, or, or no, they lost in by county to uh, was it John Glenn? And they've struggled a little bit since then. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the comments, but, then they, but then they just beat Westville. So I don't yeah, know. right. Comets will finish off at home versus North Miami next Thursday. The uh, Warriors two and seventeen. Yeah, so. yeah. Cast is still going. Yeah, and you mentioned the Winnipeg game. That'll be kind of a an intriguing matchup. Uh, Cast should maybe have a little bit of a height advantage. You know, when, when I've seen Winnipeg, they've been at their best playing zone. But again, I don't know if you can zone Cast in that much. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, the Comets hosting sectional 52 this year, so they yeah. will uh, be back at home then next the following week for uh, sectional action. We'll, you know, we'll find out who they play uh, coming up on Sunday. So down to the uh, Culver Cavaliers setting at 7-10, and 10, only 1-5 and five in the conference, 0-3 oh in their last three. Talked about that Bell game loss at Argus. Um, followed it up the uh, the next night at home. Uh, we were up there for well, – I was up there with Justin Croy and, and the crew for that one. And, uh, boy, Pioneer in town and – the Panthers uh, would would make this uh, not even close. I mean, it, it was 15 point was the final score, uh, 60 to 45. But I don't even think it was really as close as the final score would indicate. Right, Pioneer got off to a great start in this game. I think they were what eight nothing right off the bat. I mean the first points of the of the game with 2:33 to go in the first period for uh, Culver, and they only score one point there. It's Pioneer. I mean they were just firing on all cylinders. Drew McKeg just uh, outstanding in this game, but it wasn't just the Drew. I mean, great passing there into Miller. I mean, mm-hmm. Toloza on the run out. Right, I mean Toloza with his athleticism, he's and he's he's definitely looking to score more, and he's finishing too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we knew he was fast, but now he's able to put the ball in the hoop, and that's a big contribution for the uh, Panthers. And you see Jack Rogers, just as you know, he's a point guard who can actually score in the post. But you know, Pioneer just seemed to have the. Just continue to put their foot on the pedal in this game. I mean, doubling them up right here with you know four and a half minutes still to go in the in the third. And there was you know that third period there it just seemed like there was a lot of just easy run out type baskets for Pioneer. I don't, mm-hmm. You know. It's it's a rough one for Culver. Obviously, you go to Argus the night before, and then you got Pioneer uh, the next night. And it's been kind of rough for Culver the last few years, uh, trying to get the uh, the energy coming off of the Bell game. Mm-hmm. I mean, they expend a lot of energy, you know, the night before at uh, at Argus. Right, and again. Um... Pioneer, they they really moved well without the ball in this game from the highlights that I saw. Again, Rogers showing off his shooting range there. I got him down to to 17. 
Yeah, they would uh, they mm-hmm. would end up a uh, fifteen point game there. So they they did make it a little bit tighter, sixty to forty five. Your final score, mm-hmm. but uh, it just felt like it was never in doubt. Um, obviously, with the eight zero start, and right. they just never looked back. And then Culver had another frustrating loss at North Judson on Tuesday. They were actually ahead in that game by two at halftime, 30-28. But Judson came back to win 59-49. Rogers had another big game. I think he had uh, 24, but uh, Height had 11. But, uh, again, they, they um, struggled, I think, to get some defensive stops in that game. Cavs on the road on Thursday night at South Central, 8-10. and 10, And then uh, Saturday they will head up to Tri-Township or uh, Lacrosse as us older folks know it. Uh, lacrosse struggling at three and sixteen, so an opportunity there maybe for uh, Culver to pick up a couple wins. Right. Um, South Central had you know it'd be interesting to see what mood kind of or where South Central is at uh, coming off an overtime loss at Argus on Tuesday. Now they they get Culver coming to their place. So uh, how will, uh, how will they react? But I think it's a South Central team that can score. Matty Bush is the coach at South Central. Of course, his father, Matt, was a legendary coach at Morgan Township. He played for his dad while it was on some sectional championship teams, and now Matty's gotten into coaching. Okay. Um, and then to try Township, Coach Snodgrass has been at uh, been around in coaching, I think, for like 40 years. He's coached mostly at 4A schools but came to uh, the lacrosse slash tri Township schools. I think this is about his third year there. They're struggling this year at 3-16. and 16. Again, if you've never been to tri Township for a game, it's a unique, unique gym. Unique gym, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then think Hoosiers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, then I know I believe they added a game with uh, Granger Christian on Tuesday night. Okay. Because remember they still needed a game because that last by county game got the yeah. by county game they were supposed to, the by county consolation game got canceled. So I think they got Granger Christian on Tuesday and then on Wednesday Triton comes to town. Well, that's another makeup game. Mm-hmm. So again, that's a Triton team that's five and zero in the conference and sniffing a conference championship. They will be ready to go, and, and a possible sectional matchup right. as well. And I know they they've been bitten at John R. Nelson before. Coach Groves will be make sure they're ready to go. Yeah, uh, before that, and then Bremen at home next Friday. All right. So a busy last week for Culver coming up. All right. Let's take another quick break, and when we come back, we'll wrap things up talking Pioneer a little bit more and some Valley and Winnemac here on Talking Sports with Val. Kriskin's Pools and Spas is your local contractor for all your pool and hot tub installation needs. With a wide selection to choose from, Kriskin's is sure to hook you up with exactly what you need no matter what your budget is. To learn more about our services, visit kriskinspoolsandspas.com Call 574-857-3100 or stop on by at 7448 Liberty Avenue in Fulton to see how Kriskins can help you. Here we go, Billy. Swing hard. As your local agent, I know you. I know every Saturday your son Billy plays Little League. We sponsor his team. And we know you love parking way too close to the field. That's why we tailor a unique policy for you and your car. Because sometimes something from out of left field can literally come from out of left field. That's simple human sense. Ask the Jennings Insurance Agency in Argus and Rochester if auto owners make sense for you. Looking for an easy way to provide custom branded products for your business, school, sports team, or fundraising event? Let the Winning Edge set up a customized web store that features branded products tailored to your business, school, church, or charitable cause. With a wide variety of customizable apparel, sports accessories, office accessories, and custom tumblers, the Winning Edge is sure to provide you with the best style that suits you. Find your edge by calling 574-223-6090 or going to our website, thewinningedgeathletics.com, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Hello, sir. How can I help you today? I'm looking for a special gift. We have no tolerance for Tom Fulry today. What do you mean, tomfoolery? What I said was, we have a nice selection of jewelry today. Oh. May I suggest that you give my friends at Affordable Hearing a call? Affordable Hearing offers hearing testing and unique solutions for everybody. We guarantee the lowest prices in the area and now have offices in Rochester and Logansport to serve you better. Call to book an appointment today. Welcome back here Talking Sports with Val. And uh, again, we're... Filming here on Thursday, but Val's going to be down at Evansville for uh, wrestling tomorrow. This will actually 
uh, show up on Friday on uh, Channel 4 and on our website. So uh, check that out. We've got, obviously, a big weekend coming up. We've got Rochester Wrestling down at State. We have the uh, Cast and Lady Comets at Semi-State Basketball at Frankfurt. And then, of course, Sunday, our uh, sectional draw for boys basketball is going to be happening on IHSA TV. Uh, what time do you say? Five o'clock on that? Yep. Five o'clock uh, for that. No football on Sunday, so just check out the uh, the boys basketball draw. So the uh, life without football on Sundays begins. Oof. Uh, let's move on in this segment. We'll talk some Pioneer boys basketball. Uh, the, the the Panthers, you know, we talked about that win at Culver, three and zero in their last three games, and all three of those were conference wins. Uh, you know, so they're they're three and three now in the conference. They had uh, uh, a big win at Judson. They won home versus Knox, and then the road win versus Culver. Yeah, uh, the win at, the win at home over Knox that that was also a really nice win for them. Yeah, because uh, I think there was a lot of talk about you know the Schwant kid from Knox who's had a nice year. And, you know, Miles McLaughlin, I mean, we talk about him as a football player, but he's a pretty decent basketball player as well. I think they held I think he, they held him to 10, and they were able to pull out a nice win. So uh, this team is, um, they've really been, deve- they've done a, you know, Coach McKegg has done a nice job, I think, developing those players. Toloza, Rands. Mm-hmm. I mean, we knew about Drew McKegg, but I think uh, um, Noah mm-hmm. Miller with his shooting, and I, I think Micah, you know, he, he took a little bit of time just because, you know, he was dinged up, obviously, from yeah. football and, and he finally getting healthy and playing really well. Yeah, and Lucas Perry is a guy who really just competes down low. I mean, he's six feet. He's, he's you know, he's competing against guys taller than him all the time, but I think he's playing with more confidence. He's, he's definitely battling down there. And, you know, Luke Blackman's a guy who gives him some nice minutes. All, you know, uh, I think this is a team that we're – Obviously, you know Drew McKeg is kind of the the I guess you'd say the marquee player, mm-hmm. but I mean they're they're getting the the contributions for the rest of the cast has been really good. Braden Erickson's shot the ball a lot oh, better yeah. as Braden's, well. Braden's had a great year. Yeah. yeah. So, so you game at home on uh, Friday night versus Winnemac, an opportunity to finish the uh, conference at over five hundred if they yeah. get that win. They've got four games to go. I think they're all winnable. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say they're going to win them all, but they've beaten Winnemac four years in a row, and yeah. now they get them. And now they get them in Royal Center. I mean, yeah. I'm really intrigued by this game. I mean, because John Malco's been hot of late. Uh, you know, uh, the Malco, the two Malco brothers against the Pioneer guards, and uh, yeah, a defensive adjust. Obviously, Coach McKegg is going to play a zone. Again, like we said about Winnemac earlier, they like to play zone. Uh, that three-two zone is what Coach Springer likes. So how will Pioneer adapt to that? Uh, can they? Uh, I think they have, obviously you have to keep an eye on Noah Miller if you're going to play zone. Uh, I'm really curious to see in a lot of ways. I guess points in the paint. Who can get in the paint and then and go from there? That could be big. But yeah, you know, Pioneers just had a have had a lot of success against Winnemac in recent years. I mean, just just look at this valley. If if Pioneer is somehow able to pull off the win in all these games, they've got Winnemac, North White, Tri County is going to be a tough one. Uh, and West Central, if they win all four, they're going to be eleven and eleven going into the sectional. Right, and all with four a, are at uh, home. Yeah, yeah, with a four and three conference record. So, Tri County, I've seen them play. They're good. Mm-hmm. They're they're fast. It's going to be an interesting matchup. Right, they have a Zarcy also. Uh huh. And he's yeah. pretty. He's very good. Pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they are they are just fast. I mm-hmm. mean, I think the Pioneer will match up well with them. I saw mm-hmm. him play against Caston, but. Uh, you know they're three and zero, oh, and and not only that, but that would, if they can win all four of those games, that would be a seven game winning streak going into that sectional. And um, right, and you know they were four and eleven after that loss to South Newton. It was kind of like, oh boy, mm-hmm. what, where's this headed? Kudos to Coach McKeg and yeah. these guys for keeping their heads up and staying positive. Yeah, and just continuing to work. Yeah, three in a row in the conference. Mm-hmm. That's a big, uh, big stretch there. See what they can do. Winnemac on Friday at home and North White on Saturday at home. So. Mm-hmm. And next week, uh, Friday and Saturday, back to back at home, Tri County and West Central. Yeah. So Panthers head to Lewis Cass for sectional action. There is that thirty six for boys too. Yep. Yep. All right, let's move to uh, Tippecanoe Valley, setting at thirteen and six, four and zero in their last four games. Uh, Jimtown, Western, North Miami, and Knox uh, all wins. They've added a game on Friday. They're going to be headed to Lebanon, taking on the 9-11 and 11 Lebanon Tigers before 
heading down to Memorial Gymnasium on Saturday to take on Flory and the Wildcats, 19-3 and three Wildcats. Well, Cass, excuse me, Valley's just been doing it on the defensive end of late. I mean, they have been just turning the screws on teams. That win over Jimtown looks better and better and better uh, after every game. You know, they, they, they really uh, be, won at Western 47-22. I thought they'd be favored in that game. I didn't I didn't know they would just route, route them like that, and then mm-hmm. they beat North Miami uh, by 40, and then that a nice win over Knox, 63-41, to and that game wasn't even that close either. Uh, Knox hit some shots late to get it. Down to 22 at the end. Uh, Ian Cooksey's been shooting the ball, shot the ball a lot better last week. Um, Riley Shepard's been shooting the ball a lot better, and then of course Akasi, Stephen Akasi, down in the low block. So those that's the, those are their big three with Cooksey, Shepard, and Akasi. And then you know Kyler Johnson is kind of you know he he kind of stepped up offensively uh, in recent games again, and he can give you about eight to ten a game. And then Dino Davis Cowan doesn't shoot the ball very often, but when he does shoot, it goes in. Mm-hmm. And then so uh, and then you know what Wes Parker's did and done a nice job off the bench of, of late as well. And Blaine Sheets gives them some nice minutes. Yeah, you talk about a crazy last four games. They go to Lebanon, they go to Kokomo, and then they host Warsaw, and then they host South Bend, Washington to finish off. I mean, that's some tough games. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I've not seen Stephen Reynolds of South Bend, Washington play. I heard he's fantastic. Uh, I talked with Coach. Grindle. I know there's a lot of D1 coaches that think the same thing. Yeah, we talked with Joel Grindle of Plymouth. He said Warsaw has like, like a they have one of everything or two of it. They're like Noah's Ark. They <laughs> two of everything. Yeah, they, yeah, everything everything you want in a basketball team. They've got yeah. they've got shooting. They've got ball handling. They've got defense. They they got size. They got they're physical. Uh, they're they're an outstanding. Uh, Coach Moore has really uh, picked things up at Warsaw. I mean. Not that things were ever bad at yeah. Warsaw, but he's they're even better than they than they usually are. Yeah. And that'll be at Valley on Tuesday, so that will be that's always a great crowd. Yeah. Uh, Warsaw always travels well. Yeah. And uh home sectional for the Vikings. And then a home sectional, I mean they've got you know, Valley's already got wins over Bremen, John Glenn and and uh and Knox. So they don't play Culver Academy. Uh Valley's the only team in their sectional with a winning record. But again, with Culver Academy, who have they played? Uh, who do they have? Yeah, uh, we think they're pretty young, but they're kind of the mystery team as always. Mm-hmm. But Glenn, you know, Glenn won the by county. They they only lost at Valley by six. They will be formidable. Chase Miller, Shrap Louie, uh, they are a good team. Uh, uh, you know, Valley got kind of made the first kind of strong statement when they beat John Glenn earlier in the year. But they will be they will be ready to go. Yeah. So again, draw will be interesting. Who gets that Tuesday night game, and who are the other three teams that get the bye? Yeah, the Winnemac Warriors sitting at nine and eleven, one and four in the conference, one and three in their last four games. Uh, losses to Rensselaer Central at Westville and at Logansport. They did win at North White. We talked about them headed to Pioneer on Friday night. They uh, finished off the season with a uh, home game versus Caston, and then Thursday night they are at home versus Demont Christian. Yeah, a tricky, a tricky last three games for Winnemac. Um, you know, they they didn't play. You know, again, they had that seven game and fifteen day stretch that ended uh, with that win at North White. Now they've been over in the gym over a week, kind of working on things. So mm-hmm. let's see how they come out against a Pioneer team that has had their number and has beaten them four years in a row. Yeah, uh, that and, and and it's it's in Royal Center. So how how do they respond in that road environment? Um, again. Uh, the Malco brothers have been uh, increasing their output of late offensively, and then uh, Justin Potoff has been playing really well. I mean, he's he's one of the best six men in our areas because they mm-hmm. can bring Justin off the bench. He's kind of he's long and rangy, but he can handle the ball as well and does a nice job at that point guard spot. Yeah. Uh, but then you know, uh, Casson will be tricky. Casson's had their number in recent years, and then that, that Demont Christian team, they're twelve and seven. They've got that Kyle Terpstra who averages I think around uh, fourteen fifteen a game. Yeah, and then of course they will be headed down to Lewis Cass for uh, sectional play as well. So we'll find out. You know, it's going to be some interesting matchups when we get down to uh, sectional thirty-six. Right, especially now that Winnemag Winnemag doesn't play Wabash, and they don't play Lewis Cass either. So uh, it's kind of how how will they? And then they lost to Rochester. So how do they how do they fare against these sectional teams? That's why the Pioneer game is so fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, anything else here before we wrap up? Willis Dennis of Winnemag made the wrestling semi-state at East Chicago as well. Lost in the first round to uh, Reed of uh, Kyle Reed of Alparezo. 
kudos to Willis on a great year, 24-15 yeah. and 15 as a senior. Uh, they had 10 made it to regional, but he was the only one who made it to semi-state, so kudos to Willis. Uh, I wanted to say I wrote an article about the new, the new enrollment numbers came out earlier in the week, and I wrote an article about that. So you can, uh, I'd love to hear your feedback on it. It was a little more speculative than some mm-hmm. of my typical articles, kind of guessing where teams will will wind up in the next yeah. cycle. Yeah, I don't have that exact number. Should be coming out soon, though, right? The the cutoff lines. Right, the the official cutoff lines. Yeah. We were yeah. we we were speculating. But yeah. Again, these were just raw enrollment figures, and then they wound up. Uh, Argus's was listed at fifty-seven, but it wound up being there was a clerical error. It was actually two hundred and three. Yeah. And then Rochester's was listed at one sixty-four. It was actually four seventy-three. Yeah. It, 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 Rochester's enrollment though did decline from four ninety-five to four seventy-three over the last two-year cycle. Uh, what was interesting is that Bremen also is going way down, and Knox is going down. So we think Rochester, Bremen, and Knox who are all in the same three A girls basketball sectional, likely all going to be in. Could all be in the same two A girls basketball sectional next yeah, year, yeah. or at least could all be in two A at least. Right, and that's 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 interesting if you're a Bremen fan because you're playing in a three A semi state on Saturday, and you'll all be in two A next year almost certainly. Yeah, Pioneer with, will be uh, with your top three scorers coming back. Right, Pioneer will be in uh, probably be in one A as well as North Miami moving down to one A uh, there as well. So right, and uh, you know one A if you want to. Have, have some fun. Look at what the one A is going to look like because now we get twenty, essentially twenty more teams in one A next yeah, year. Yeah. What's it? What is it going to look like? Are they going to send cast in east, west, or north? Yeah. <laughs> or and, yeah. dare I say it even south? Who what, knows? They put yeah. Who knows? Right. Uh, Logan Sport. We're wondering about will they be three A or four A? North Newton. Will they be one A or two A? We'll have our eye on those two because they're really, really close to the line. Both of those. I know Bo. Bo said he thinks that uh, Logan will be the smallest four A. Mm-hmm. So we'll see where that ends up. So uh, good luck coming up here. Obviously to the Rochester wrestlers down at Evansville for state. Val will be down there and uh, is down there now. We're recording this Thursday, but we'll be down there all day Friday and Saturday. And, of course, good luck to the cast and lady comments at Frankfurt on Saturday. And I plan on writing an article in the next day or so that combines the two, Rochester wrestling and cast and girls basketball. There's a little bit of a relation there, I isn't think, there? I think you know, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Stay so, tuned for that. Uh, a couple a couple of the Rochester wrestlers that are related to uh, some of the uh, cast and lady comments. So, yeah. Interesting stuff, and then, uh, you know, uh, congratulations, too, to Alexa Finke. She had her gymnastics senior night uh, on, on Wednesday night. Wasn't that awesome? I think the entire, like, the entire basketball team. Yeah, and their families. At least the seniors went to went to see her. Yeah. 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 So good stuff there. She's been competing with the, uh, not with the Logan Sport team, but with Logan Sport at, uh, you know, as an individual for casting. Mm-hmm. So cast and gymnastics. Mm-hmm. Gotta love it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good luck to everybody. Thanks for tuning in. See ya.